Thank you so much for having me here today. So, you know, in the backdrop of existential challenges like climate change and income inequality, there is a lot of talk these days about the fact that capitalism as we know it is broken. And moving from a shareholder-centric capitalism model, we need to move to a more humane one called stakeholder capitalism. But the question today is this, is changing the market mechanism and creating more rules and regulations going to solve these existential challenges that we have today? That's what we're going to muscle with today. So let me start by setting some context. Our world today is headlined by two major megatrends, hyperconnectivity and overpopulation. Everyone and everything is today connected, no surprise there. And in terms of population, we are today 7.5 billion people going up to 9 billion by 2060 or earlier, and uh, by some estimates, by the end of the century, by 12, uh, to 12 or 13 billion. Now, together, these two megatrends are the perfect double-edged sword because they give us exciting growth opportunities on one hand and daunting even existential challenges on the other. Let's look at these one by one. In terms of exciting opportunities created by hyperconnectivity and overpopulation. Let me ask you a quick, quick uh, quiz question. How many cars do you think every 1,000 Americans own between them? Take a guess. Yes, that's right. The number is 800. So between every 1,000 Americans, they have 800 cars, and this is the largest number of car ownership per capita in the world. Now that you know that the number in America, which is the highest in the world, is 800, what do you think that number is in China? and in India, it's 250. Can you see opportunity, opportunity, opportunity written all over this map? And this is why they call the current times the Asian century. Automakers are salivating looking at Asia. Now, speaking about India, India is a bit of a strange country, you know. It is at the same time one of the richest and one of the poorest countries in the world. Why do I say that? Well, India's luxury goods market is 350 million consumers. That's more than the entire population of the United States. And also, the number of people living in below poverty line are also the lar one of the largest in India. So richest and poorest at the same time. Now, with connectivity, so markets, these markets, the, the size of these markets is all about the opportunity. With connectivity, just about anybody anywhere with a broadband connection can either start a business or can start a movement. So see the power, see the opportunity that these two mega trends are giving us. The other side is the daunting challenges. Here's one of them. Eight out of 10 Americans see more risks than benefits from personal data collection. So while we are giving away our privacy click after click without reading the, the lengthy uh, agreements on the websites that we visit, it's also making us naked. It's making us completely exposed. And that's a huge problem. Here's another one. Six billion of us have mobile phones, but only four and a half billion, billion of us have access to a toilet. And I'm sorry to state that if you really got to go, there is no app on your phone for that. Social unrest is rising. And some political bosses are taking advantage of that to win elections and do other things that are not particularly productive. 40% of Asia will have severe water shortage by 2050. And the last one is the most alarming. Almost half of humanity lives on less than five and a half dollars a day. Daunting challenges coexisting with exciting opportunities. Can we, can we, take advantage of these exciting opportunities by ignoring those challenges that that is somebody else's problem? Can business thrive on these opportunities by ignoring those challenges completely? Better still, can business drive profitable growth and economic value by addressing these very challenges head on? These are the, some of the questions of our times. In a nutshell, my friends, our world today, people are empowered but unequal and exposed. Something's got to be done. Otherwise, we are in for really big trouble. Now, what should we do? COVID-19 actually gives us a clue. What is the biggest lesson that COVID-19 has taught us? Anyone? Well, it is this. 
no one is safe until everyone is safe. We've learned that from COVID and from connectivity. We know that, you know, from the 2008 financial crisis, from the dot-com bust of the uh, beginning of the century, you name it, and we know that the world is now so connected that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And COVID has brought this out more than ever before. Yet, most of our personal aspirations are narrow. It's all about my position, my power, my family, my company, and my country. And most of how business and governments are run, governance, whether internal governance in a company or corporate governance by the board, it's mostly rules and policies based. And those rules and policies fail to create deep change. My friends, we need to think much bigger and much broader. So clearly, we need to do something different. But what is it? Here's where the different models are being uh, bandied about. Some people are saying more regulation and harsher punishment for those people who pollute the environment or uh, don't pay a price for carbon or leave people behind and things like that. But there is hardly any evidence that more regulation and harsher punishment prevents bad behavior. In fact, it definitely does not promote good behavior. It may prevent some bad behavior at best. Another one is, let's move from capitalism to something softer, something more inclusive. Well, before we do that, let's look at some of these things. Uh, global uh, population living in extreme poverty has reduced dramatically from 1990 to today. It's less than 10% today. It used to be as high as 36% just in 1990. So capitalism is getting something right. Literacy, access to health care and water and electricity similarly are all up. So let's be careful before we say that we have to just drop a market mechanism altogether. And then some people are saying, oh, let's become purpose driven. Let's give up some profit for more purpose. But the question is, is that a zero sum game? And is it even possible to do good without profit? And must do good come at the expense of profit? So, you know, the solution is not as easy as some people make it out to be. We need something longer lasting. We certainly need to focus on things like ESG, on sustainability and things like that. But I ask you this, is ESG excellence, the examples of ESG excellence that we have seen so far, is it a function of regulation and reporting or is it a function of genuine leadership? Clearly, by the title of my presentation today, we believe that it's genuine leadership. So let's take a, a tour down memory lane and see how leadership has evolved uh, through our times and what we need, what kind of leadership we need today. So here's the evolution of leadership theory and practice. It started off with leadership being a great man, not woman, man, uh, powerful, big, in a big, powerful position, telling other people what to do. Lots of charisma and this, that, and the other. Slowly, we move to behavior theory and contingency theory and then situational leadership and so on and so forth. But towards, uh, as we come towards current day, we realize that leadership is not so much about position. It's not so much about power. It's about service. It's about giving. So that's how we've evolved in terms of our understanding of leadership up to now. And our world has also evolved. We started with our planet be people being unconnected largely and sparsely populated. Powerless, uninformed, anonymous people. And there were limited opportunities for growth and limited challenges that we had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. To come to today, our planet is connected and overpopulated, people are empowered but unequal, as I said earlier, and exposed. And there are exciting growth opportunities and daunting challenges that coexist, as I said a few minutes ago. So that's where we've come so far. Let's look at where do we go from here. So our planet is hyperconnected and overpopulated, people empowered but unequal and exposed. And there are exciting opportunities and daunting challenges. Here's the issue. These exciting opportunities give way to unchecked greed. And if greed is unchecked, in some cases, it can cause serious harm, as we've seen with some examples in recent years. The daunting challenges require responsible action now. 
they require responsible action yesterday. So wanted a new model to drive responsible and inclusive growth. Question is, what is it going to be? Leadership, stewardship, uh, sustainability, ESG focus, this kind of leadership, that kind of leadership? What is the real answer? Let's look at this a little bit more closely. Leadership today, we define it as a genuine desire and persistence to create a better future. Gone are the days when we used to think about leadership as a position and title and a powerful entity telling other people what to do. Today, leadership is seen as a verb, not an adjective or a pronoun. It is about what leaders do, and they create a better future. This definition was serving us pretty OK for the last 15 years or so. But even this now becomes inadequate. Why? Because of the lesson that COVID-19 has just taught us, no one is safe until everyone is safe. It's not enough for me to create a better future for myself and my company and my country. I need to think bigger. So this is why some people started talking about stewardship, which is creating long-term value by balancing the needs of all stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. Now, stewardship, if defined this way, says we have nothing against profit. Business exists to make a profit. Businesses exist to create growth. But please do so by taking care of the needs of a varied set of stakeholders, not just shareholders. And certainly don't do it at the expense of society, future generations, and the environment. So this is, this is the stewardship model that they are banding about now as the solution. Now, before we settle for this, a couple of things about stewardship in this definition. Sustainability, ESG focus, stakeholder capitalism, taking care of your employees, taking care of society, these are all different forms of stewardship. And by its very nature, stewardship creates a collective better future, not just a narrowly focused collective uh, uh, future. So, what, is, what do we need going forward by way of a model? I think the answer lies in combining the concept of leadership and stewardship. So let's take a part of the leadership definition that call it steward leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a better future, but not just any better future. Let's borrow from stewardship and make it a collective better future. So ladies and gentlemen, what we all need to imbibe today is steward leadership, which is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future. So all this play of words and a tour of history, and you're probably wondering, well, what does that mean in day-to-day -day life and in practice? I got a company to run. I got returns to show to my stakeholders. Uh, all this wordplay and all this definition work, uh, where does it take me? What do I do tomorrow morning, and what do I do on an ongoing basis? So this is where we're going to present to you a simple model of how to bring this alive in your company. How do you practice steward leadership and still drive superior returns for your key stakeholders. Let's look at that. So as we said, steward leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future. How does this, or where does this genuine desire and persistence come from? Well, it comes from crafting and operationalizing the stewardship core compass for the organization. Don't get worried with these fancy words. It's a simple four-step model. Three of those steps are foundational, and one, the fourth step, is something that you do every day, day in and day out. We're going to make it very simple and unpack it for you in such a way that you can put it to practice very fast. Here are the four steps. The first step is to identify the most important organizational values. What does the organization believe in in terms of values? And most organizations already have a current set of values. So really, the next step is where we start, which is add to your existing set of values four stewardship values. Here those are. Now, before I go into what these four stewardship values are, what we recommend is that your total set of values, four stewardship values plus some existing ones, don't have a set more than six or seven. So now that you've added these four stewardship values, let's take a look at what these are. The first is interdependence. 
You have to believe that your success depends on the rest of the world and vice versa. We all live in an interdependent world where our success depends on others and their success depends on ours. If you don't believe in interdependence, you don't believe in stewardship. It's as simple as that. And when you start believing in these sorts of values, you make very difficult decisions very quickly. Let me give you an example. Dan Price, who runs a company called Gravity Payments in the United States, he was drawing a salary of uh, $1.5 million and getting other kinds of uh, compensation from the company when some employees came and told him that, you know, at the minimum level, we get paid $35,000 a year. That's not enough to send our kids to college or to have even a decent life. Because he believed in interdependence so much and in long-term view and ownership mentality so much, he took no time whatsoever to, to double everybody's salaries to 70000 and cut his own salary to 70000 And he said, well, my success is interdependent with those of my employees. And if I believe in these values, I, the company is going to thrive and we are going to actually expand the pie. Long-term view, as I mentioned, is to take that long-term view as to it's, it's not a sprint, it's, not, it's a marathon. Ownership mentality. You have to feel that it is my job to be a steward leader, not just any leader. My job is not just to create growth, but my job is to create growth in a way that, that addresses the daunting challenges that humanity uh, fa is facing. And creative resilience basically says, Come what may, I know that the journey to create superior returns through steward leadership is going to be harder, but I will not give up. I will find creative solutions to all the obstacles that come my way. So that's the, the second step, which is to add these four values to your existing set of values. But just putting fancy posters of these values is not going to cut it. You need to actually create a culture where these values are alive and kicking. What happens is most organizations have a set of values, which they put on their websites, which they put on their hallways, and then they have internal rules and policies and procedures uh, with which they control everything, in particular the behavior of human resources. Now, I've asked many boards and I've asked many senior management teams that if you were to divide 100 units of management time that you use, um, on either of those two axes. How much time do you spend on framing and enforcing rules and policies? And how much time do you spend on making sure that people are actually living their values? If they are honest with themselves, they say 80, 20, or 90, 10, meaning a vast majority of the time goes in framing and enforcing rules. Before long, what happens is your culture becomes a red ocean of bureaucracy. On the one hand, we tell people to think like an owner and think outside the box. And then we pu keep putting them into boxes upon boxes of rules, procedures, policies that they cannot even breathe. My friends, in today's day and age, rules get outdated before the ink dries on them. And if you rule and if you govern based on rules, terrible things are likely to happen. One example is this. Is this picture familiar to you? Some of you have guessed it, yes. It is United Airlines dragging this passenger out of the aircraft uh, against his will after beating him up when he refused to give up his seat voluntarily. This video went viral a few years ago. Classic case, overbooking, and the airline offers a short haul flight. The airline offices, uh, offers $300 as compensation for somebody to give up a, a seat voluntarily and go on the next flight an hour later. Usually, somebody takes that up, they go outside, they have a beer, wait for an hour, and then take the next flight, and they pocket $300. Well, that day, nobody gave up. Now, the rule book says, if nobody gives up their seat voluntarily, pick somebody at random and throw them out. So they pick this guy, Dr. David Dow, and he refused to leave. He says, I have urgent uh, things waiting for me on the other end. I cannot leave. I mean, he, no, according to the book, you are supposed to leave. We picked you at random. He says, I won't. So they beat him up. Uh, and they dragged him out, and that's the video that went viral. Now, here's the fun part. No, no, it's not even fun. I shouldn't even say that. You know what the first words the CEO uttered when this video went viral? He said, my employees did nothing wrong. They followed stated industry policy. If there was a bigger PR disaster, I would like to know of it. Later, 
after apologizing a million times and paying even more millions in fines and, uh, and, and, and damages, etc., uh, they tried to do some damage control, but the damage was already done. I want to ask the CEO a simple question. If, instead of feeling compelled to follow the rules, your employees had felt empowered to follow your values, which are all based on customer centricity in your case, would your people have found, worked harder to find a different solution? Let me repeat that. If, instead of feeling compelled to follow the rules, your employees had felt empowered to follow the values, would they have worked harder to find a different solution? The answer, of course, is yes. And it's very simple. If I felt empowered as an employee to do something out of the box, I would offer $500, $1,000, $1.5, $1 $2,000. At some point, somebody would give up their seat. And that would cost me a lot less than the millions in damage and reputational loss that actually happened. So that's why in today's economy, a rules-based governance system doesn't work. You have to uh, sort of flip it on its head and create a culture where spirit of the law prevails, where people are empowered to live the values. Just putting up those fancy posters is not enough. Now, let me give you an example of when this happens. Netflix. Netflix, like any other company, used to have a big, thick binder of rules in terms of what people can do, employees can do when they travel on business. When can you travel economy? When can you travel business? How much can you spend for breakfast or lunch, etc.? Thick binder. When they decided to switch this over to spirit of the law, they got rid of that binder and replaced the policy with one sentence. Act in Netflix's best interest. And guess what happened? Guess what happened to travel and entertainment expenses over the next few years? They went down significantly. Because now it was up to the employee to decide what is right in Netflix interest. So not only does it free up people, it adds speed in today's high-speed economy. It creates flexibility. And more often than not, people will do the right thing. In my research, less than 5% of the people, when you give them freedom and, and, and trust, less than 5% of the people will try to misuse it. 95 or more will actually surprise you with good and better behavior. So gone are the days where rigid SOPs and policies and procedures were going to run the business world. We need to think differently. That's the idea behind adding those stewardship values. OK, the next step. The third step is to now, based on those values, give your company a stewardship purpose. What is a stewardship purpose, and how is it different from other purposes, any other purpose? Well, it creates a collective better future for a varied variety of stakeholders, including shareholders, society, and future generations. It's creating economic and social value together. That's the difference between any other purpose and stewardship purpose. Articulate that clearly, that we are in the business of creating long-term value by addressing whatever challenges of humanity that you want to address. And that then brings us to the final step, which is now that you have your values, including the stewardship values and a stewardship purpose, make sure that every decision the company makes and every action and every step the organization takes is governed by and aligned to the company's stewardship core compass. So the first three steps, as I said, are foundational. The fourth one is where the rubber hits the road. This is what you do every day, day in and day out, by creating this kind of culture based on values, based on purpose, rather than based on policies, procedures, and punishment. I'll give you a couple of examples when this is done right. Howard Schultz, who was running Starbucks until recently, uh, there was a time when he uh, stepped away from being CEO and just became chairman of the board. And soon after that, the company's growth slowed down significantly. Now, by way of background, Starbucks, uh, as per Schultz's dream, uh, became the first company in America and perhaps in the world to provide full health care benefits even to part-time workers. And then if you work for more than 20 hours a week, you could even participate in the company's stock option plan. So when the growth started reducing or slowing down, Wall Street analysts said, well, your company is doing well. The business model is good. All you need to do is slash your benefits cost because they are too extravagant, and you'll be fine. Schultz's response, without thinking about it for even a minute, 
upon my dead body. And he comes back as CEO, digs into his creative resilience to find other solutions to ignite growth, but did not cut employee benefits. Again, if everything is guided by your stewardship core compass, your values and your purpose, the biggest decisions become easy. There was another case at Google a few years ago where a very high-performing young engineer wrote an eight-page so-called research paper explaining why women are inferior to men, both in terms of technology and leadership skills. Hence, Google should not even aspire for gender equality at the top. This memo goes viral. And now, when the CEO finds out that this is what has been written without any hesitation, he orders that this gentleman be fired right away and taken off campus within the next 60 minutes. How did he make such a huge decision so quickly? Stewardship core compass. The, pr the, the problem in the Google case was not as simple, you see, because they, one of their values was freedom of expression. And the other one was uh, uh, treating everybody equality, uh, equally, uh, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender. So here were two values, and he was practicing one of the values, but it was clashing with the other values. Yet the CEO had no hesitation to say, fire him. Which brings me to the point that even within your values, there has to be a hierarchy of which one is most important, second, third, fourth, fifth. This kind of work of setting up the compass needs to be done so that when you get to step four, it's clear in each and every case. So that's it, my friends. It's not rocket science. Practicing steward leadership boils down to these four steps, of which only the fourth one you have to do day in and day out. And I can guarantee you today, there is plenty of research that says, in a world that is totally transparent, where your customer and your consumer, particularly the millennial generation, is watching every step you take and your company takes, only if you lead your business with these values and purpose will you create superior value. Let me show you just one study. Here's uh, over a four-year period, they studied companies which were uh, and their track record on ESG factors. Companies that were highest rated on their ESG practices outperformed the S&P in this period. And in the same period, the lowest rated companies on ESG significantly underperformed the same S&P. Now, I've just shown you this one study. There are many, many such studies that come out almost every week these days that are pointing in the same direction. In fact, uh, there are uh, meta-analyses of hundreds of studies have also pointed out in the same way. Uh, one another great example that comes to mind always is Paul Polman, the former CEO of Unilever, who in 10 years created 290% shareholder wealth uh, growth for shareholders by saying, I am going to think about society first and company second and make a business model of that. So my friends, whether you do it because you want to do it, you want to leave the planet safe for your children and your grandchildren, because that is our duty of our generation, or you want to do it to create superior returns, whichever way you come at it, the answer lies in steward leadership. So that's in a nutshell what I wanted to share with you today. Of course, there's a lot more detail behind it. If you are at all interested, do get in touch with us, and we'd be happy to engage with you in any which way we can. Thank you so much for that very, very insightful presentation. Please stay with us. I think we have a few questions from the audience. Well, OK, here goes the first question for you. How can we encourage people or society to think bigger and broader? It is natural that someone at the bottom of the pyramid think of themselves of survival only, and of, like there's no tomorrow. At the other extreme, we have the most powerful country in the world thinking of itself and how it can remain the most powerful often at the expense of other countries. Yeah, so the, back to the question, how can we encourage people or society to think bigger and broader? Yeah, that's the question. Uh, thank you, Amelda. The, uh, you know, two points I'll make here. One is that thinking bigger and broader is a matter of choice well, and awareness. So how can we make people think bigger and broader? The only vehicle in my mind that works really well is education, is to make people aware of what is at stake, how uh, precarious uh, the planet is today, and why we need to make wiser choices. So it's all about the education. Your second part of your question, which is um, you know, top or bottom uh, part of the pyramid, well, again, 
Whether it's at the top of the pyramid or bottom of the pyramid is still a matter of choice. There are plenty of, uh, uh, of uh, examples from history where people didn't wait uh, to become rich themselves uh, in order to uh, then give back to the world or to then uh, do something uh, that is sensible. Uh, it, it, you can make that choice at any time. Boils down to how aware are you? Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Well, we have another question coming in. Um, are there universal values and rules? People talk about rules-based society, but someone has to define the rules, and it's usually the rich and powerful who will define them, making it advantages for themselves. So values are also a result of the society and culture that we grew up in. Some societies may value societal rights over individual rights, and well, other societies may value individual freedom more. So back to the question, are there universal values and rules? Over to you, Mr. Rajiv. So values do differ by culture and by geography. There's a lot of research that says that, you know, when you move from the West to the East, values change more from uh, being uh, very individually focused and, and, and to very societally uh, or collectively focused, from being very rules focused in the West to very uh, relationship focused in the East. So yes, there are cultural differences based on uh, what we, uh, the, the circumstances in which we've, we've grown. Uh, that said, again, regardless of which culture you grew up in, anybody and everybody anywhere in the world has the ability and the power to stand and look back at any point of time and say, who am I? What are my values? And are my values the same as the culture in which I grew up? If that is the case, am I happy with that? Or do I want to adopt some other values? Uh, the key in determining your values is, A, you have a choice to do that to do it proactively and forget about which society you grew up in and what those societies values were. You ask yourself, what legacy do I want to leave? What will my children remember me as? And what example do I want to set for them? What will they be proud of me for? So then you choose your values regardless of which culture they come from, the ones that you want. And if you believe in stewardship, then the collective values, the four collective values that I talked about uh, uh, are paramount. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Okay, we have another question for you. No one is safe until everyone is safe. If I don't feel safe, does it matter if others feel safe? Some people feel that they need a weapon to be safe. As a result, everyone carries a weapon and hence everyone is unsafe. How do we get out of this conundrum? You know, uh, it's very interesting. We uh, humans uh, don't learn from history. Uh, this idea that I was talking about earlier, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Uh, we should have learned this lesson by now. And yet, as you rightly said, some people just buy a gun and buy a weapon that, you know, I need to be safe myself. But my question back to you is this. If you use violence against somebody, what are the chances that there will be no re retaliation? Whether one country attacks another country or one individual attacks another individual, what are the chances that there will be no retaliation? Have we forgotten the basic fact that an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind? And has COVID-19 taught us nothing, which is that I cannot just protect my country or my family or my society against this virus. We have to act collectively as the whole world. Humans were designed to collaborate to love, not to fight. And through history, we are not learning that. And that is why the need for stewardship, which is to think interdependence. It, you have to believe that in today's interconnected world, I cannot succeed and I cannot enjoy the benefits of my success and I cannot be safe until I think and act collectively. That is interdependence is the basic tenet of stewardship. And sadly enough, we should have learned this lesson a long, long time ago, even in 2021, they're still talking about it and they needed a global pandemic to remind us uh, about this. So I urge everyone to think about this very deeply as to who you are and what do you want to do. Rajiv, love the steward leadership definition. I think we have one more question for you, a last question for you. Is there a ranking among the four core compass components? If yes, please explain. And if not, why not? So, uh, you know, uh, those four values is what makes up stewardship and the stewardship core compass lays them out. Uh, 
here's the thing, whether they are those plus one or two others that are your personal values that you want to, or, or organizational values that you want to make as the complete set of values, each organization and each individual must think very clearly which one is the most important for them, the next most important, and there should be a hierarchy, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we don't recommend more than six or seven, uh, including the four of stewardship. Uh, you must be clear as an organization, as an individual, which one is the most important second. There is no universal formula that this is the first and this is the second. Each organization and each uh, individual must decide, but you must. Why? Because when push comes to shove, when you have to make the most difficult decision, when you are between a rock and a hard place, it is only the clarity of the hierarchy that will make you decide. I gave the example of the, um, uh, of the Google case earlier uh, in, my, uh, in my presentation. Basically, how did the CEO decide so quickly that just because somebody insulted half of humanity, he should be fired immediately? There were people who were saying, no, he was expressing his, uh, his, uh, his mind. He was uh, using the value of freedom of speech, which is also one of the key tenets at Google. So why are we penalizing him for just speaking out his mind just because we don't like his idea? The reason why they were able to make that decision very quickly was that the, the, in the hierarchy of values, treating everybody with respect and dignity, regardless of race or gender, uh, was more important than um, uh, speaking out your mind and, uh, and freedom of speech. Uh, that is why they were able to do that. So that hierarchy has to be very clear, but each organization and each individual needs to decide what it is for them, depending on the legacy that you want to leave. Thank you once again, Mr. Raji, for joining us this morning. We hope you can join us again next year. Thank you so much for having me.